Ali Vyaz is the director of the Iran Project at the International Crisis Group, and he's joining me now from Washington. Uh, welcome back to the program. Thank you. Great to be with you, Christian. So, okay, so look, remind us where we were this time five years ago in terms of controlling the Iranian nuclear program and where we are now. So on 8th of May uh, 2018, Iran uh, was under the most rigorous monitoring regime that has ever been established by the UN nuclear watchdog. Uh, it would take Iran about 12 months to enrich enough uh, nuclear material for a single nuclear weapon. Um, and Iran was fully complying uh, by its obligations under the deal. Uh, and of course, by the time that President uh, uh, Biden walked into the Oval Office, that timeline had shrunk uh, and is now, right now, according to Pentagon officials, uh, at 12 days. So instead of 12 months, it is 12 days. Uh, and Iran has rolled back a lot of those monitoring mechanisms. And so the transparency of the program uh, is way less than what it was in the past. And the IAEA is blind about a lot of Iran's nuclear activities. So, so uh, in one sentence, yeah. Christian, uh, the Trump administration managed to take Iran's nuclear program out of a box uh, and to put it in the microwave. Wow, uh, that, that's dramatic the way you say that. So just, just, just be clear, the Trump administration said that we can get a better deal and they launched a process called maximum pressure where they tried to squeeze Iran with more sanctions and a lot more um, punitive measures, thinking that that would cause them to act in a different way. What exactly did maximum pressure achieve? Well, it has been an abject failure across the board. Of course, it has brought Iran to the verge of nuclear weapons. Iran has never been closer. Uh, and uh, it has also rendered Iran much more uh, aggressive in the region. In 2019, you remember the hot summer of that year uh, when Iran started attacking uh, shipping lanes and tankers and uh, energy infrastructure, uh, including in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and it has rendered Iran much more aggressive uh, and repressive at home. Uh, we have seen that uh, every protest that has happened since maximum pressure uh, has been uh, met with uh, the brutality that uh, we've all seen on, on TV screens in the past few years. Um, and uh, and I, I would want to also add that uh, let's not rem forget the fact that the Iranian people uh, have been living under uh, not just pressure from the above, from their own regime, but also pressure from the outside, from the United States, uh, and estimates uh, suggest that uh, at least uh, around uh, 600 people uh, have died as a result of short, uh, shortages of medicine uh, that the U.S. sanctions have caused. Um, Ali Vais, so what then is the option? We said and we know that there have been basically indirect negotiations between Iran and the United States via the Europeans and the other signatories to the what was known as the JCPOA, the uh, nuclear deal. But President Biden was caught sort of off mic uh, not so long ago, saying that this deal is dead. Is it completely dead? Is there any attempt? I know that you and uh, other experts like Vali Nasser and even J Street, the, the, the Israeli activist, the Jewish activist group in, in Washington, have called for a different kind of engagement. Can you walk us through that? Sure. Uh, first, uh, Christian, let me say that as a proponent uh, of the nuclear deal with Iran, it's very hard for me to admit uh, that uh, uh, the Biden administration and the hardliners in Iran succeeded in what uh, President Trump failed at, which was to kill the JCPOA. Now, there's plenty of blame to go around. Uh, I think, uh, obviously, the original sin uh, was committed by uh, Donald Trump. Uh, but, uh, but then uh, the Biden is, uh, administration hesitated in 2021, and in 2022, Iran miscalculated and lost uh, uh, multiple opportunities to restore the deal. Uh, right now, as we speak, uh, I think the White House's preference is for some kind of a narrower agreement, an interim deal that would just freeze the program so that it would not become a problem in an election year as we enter into the campaign period. Um, and, uh, and the Iranians are really not interested in anything less than the JCPOA because even the deal itself really didn't benefit them economically as much as they expected. A narrower deal would definitely uh, not do that. So we're currently in a situation that I describe as no deal, no crisis, uh, that I think the Biden administration would want to extend until 2025. Uh, but there are two problems with it. 
Number one, it is unstable. We're really at the mercy of a single incident. If Israel, for instance, uh, commits another sabotage of an Iranian nuclear facility, assassination of an Iranian nuclear scientist, uh, we might see significant escalation uh, in ways that would cross uh, a U.S. or Israeli red line, for instance, if the Iranians enrich to 90 percent. Uh, the second problem with, uh, with the strategy is that uh, imagine we can keep a lid on it until 2025. Then what? In 2025, Iran would have 200 percent of the leverage it had in 2015. It is not going to agree to a deal that is tilted more in the interest of the United States. It's probably going to ask for way more concessions uh, that even the next administration would not be ab able to afford. And that is why I think time has come for uh, a new thinking, different kind of thinking. Uh, and what we're suggesting uh, right now uh, is that if you look at uh, um, the current situation compared to 2015, in 2015, Iran had good relations with the West and was on speaking terms with the United States, but bad relations with its neighbors in the Gulf region. Mm -hmm. Now is the other way around. And in that, there is an opportunity to make sure that Iran can actually benefit from an agreement uh, by uh, encouraging uh, the economic incentives to go to Iran via the Gulf rather than uh, from uh, Europe and the United States. And in return, Iran and the Gulf Cooperation uh, Council countries uh, could come to an agreement that they would all uh, accept permanent limits on the level of enrichment and reprocessing of plutonium and on ratification of the additional protocol which ensures uh, a very high level of transparency in a permanent fashion. So let me then put this to you, because I've obviously interviewed quite a few people uh, on this, because it is getting, as you say, to a very, very threshold level and very rapid breakout level. I spoke to former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton um, not so long ago, but of course it was also at a time, which is still the case, where many people around the world are very, very concerned that what happened in violating the human rights of so many people in Iran during the women's protests, the jailings, the executions, the sham trials, uh, the crackdowns, none of this is conducive. This, this is what Hillary Clinton told me about the possibility of negotiating. I would not be negotiating with Iran on anything right now, including the nuclear agreement. I think that frankly, horses out of the barn. When Trump pulled us out, we lost um, the eyes that we had on what they were doing inside Iran. And I, I believe that they started those centrifuges uh, spinning again. And I think it's unlikely that any agreement would be uh, agreed to. And I don't think we should look like we're seeking an agreement at a time when the people of Iran are standing up uh, to their oppressors. So, I mean, that's a compelling case for not dealing with them at this moment. Do you think that still stands? Is that kind of feeling, and I, I understand it exists in parts of the EU as well, is that going to sort of rule the day at the moment? Uh, look, the, the West can choose not to negotiate with Iran, but it wouldn't resolve the problem. Iran's nuclear program is si still advancing uh, at a speed of light, and at some stage, uh, we would be once again faced with the dilemma of whether we can live with Iran with a bomb or bomb Iran. And so we would eventually get to that stage unless we find a solution. And, uh, you know, it's true that it's difficult to deal with unsavory, murderous regimes. But uh, if we wanted to uh, apply that logic, uh, for instance, to the Soviet Union and say that as long as the Soviet Union was engaged in violations of human rights or uh, policy or foreign policy that was problematic from the Western perspective, uh, we would never agree to arms control deals with them. Uh, we would be living in a much more dangerous world right now. And a regime like the Iranian regime, uh, that cannot be trusted even with pellet guns. As you have seen, uh, it has blinded hundreds of peaceful protesters in the past few months. How can we dis trust this regime uh, with the deadliest weapons out there? And so I do believe that uh, regardless of the nature of the regime, there is a need to find a solution to this nuclear crisis.